Welcome to This Week in BJJ, the only show running the gamut of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and running it live every Friday night. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a brand new episode of This Week in BJJ. I'm Budo Jake. Today is December 21st, 2012. And Budo Dane, I see you're still alive. I survived. I got attacked by Mayans at least three times. So I've been, I had to run through bushes and stuff to get here, but safe. Now, you know, we joke about it, but it's surprising how many people take this seriously, this Mayan end of the world thing. I've heard talk all over at the academy, right. at work, and everywhere. I saw actually billboards of someone like the prophecy of the Mayans, mm -hmm. which, and I have it on good information from you because you had actually gone down to Mexico to the Mayan temples, right? Right. And what did you find out? Yeah, down there in, in Chichen Itza, which is in, in Cancun, they have all the temple, all the uh, Mayan ruins. And, and they were talking about the fact that even though a cycle ends, that doesn't mean that the world ends, it just means a new cycle begins according to their calendar, just like sun, Saturday ends and Sunday begins. It's not, not the end of anything, really. But um, I heard in, in Michigan, 30 schools were closed today <laughs> because of the end of the world. Wow. And not that they actually believed that it would end, but people were talking about you know threats like, hey, if it's going to end, you might as well go out with a bang and things like that. They right. said it became such a distraction that they... They figured they just close the schools. It makes me wonder how much, like, <laughs> like how many bullets and canned food items were bought. Yeah, <laughs> in preparation. Yeah, like Campbell's food stock right now is through the roof. Yep, sales of self defense DVDs at Budo Videos has been through the roof. People preparing for this. Oh wow, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Third guest tonight is uh, well, actually, I'm drinking the uh, Shock Top End of the World Midnight Wheat, which I was pleasantly surprised. I'm a big fan of Shock Top, and um, has a very unique taste. It doesn't. It doesn't taste like you think a, like a, a, a beer that brown would look either, right? Mm -hmm. And what are you drinking? I am drinking the Anderson Valley Winter Solstice Ale, or as I like to call it, the adult cream soda, because it's heavily spiced and it tastes almost exactly like cream soda, which could either be a good thing or a bad thing depending on you know how you want to pace yourself, I think. So interesting selection of beers today. Thanks, Budo Dave, for bringing those in. So we got lots of news to talk about. Well, actually, not a lot. This, you know, it's the end of the year. Uh, we're getting close to Christmas. Not a lot of things going on. People aren't interested in cutting weight, so not a lot of events happening. Mm -hmm. But we do have a couple things to talk about. Let's take a look at the news. You know, when you talk about geese, one of the, the company that's really doing big things these days is Show Your Roll. And the biggest release they've had in the past few months has been the Her Honor Gi, which is a gi that, uh, that you got one of for, for your girlfriend. Right. But they're not just for women, they're for men also. Um, we have a video clip here that we're seeing. Um, but these things did really well. Uh, they have a lot of unique cuts just for women. Dan, you tell me some of the things that uh, your girl complains about. One of the things is uh, Terry has generally wears, a wears A0s for, um, for geese, men's geese in her size. And it's always a little bunchy around the shoulder. And I originally brought her, um, I think it's the A1F from the, in her honor. Um, and she put it on. And we, I was wondering, like, oh, is this going to fit well? And she immediately fell in love with it because, for once, it wasn't like she was wearing shoulder pads. She didn't have the bunching in the corner of the shoulders. Um, it fit her really well. Um, the other thing too, and I was surprised by this, is that it looks like a really plain gi in the um, in the shots. But when you actually look at it, it's actually pretty intricate. There's gray stitching throughout. You know, there's pink accents. So it's a really cool gi. Um, if you're a woman, definitely check out the female cuts because I think they'll I think they'll pleasantly surprise you. Yeah, unlike most previous Shoei Roll releases, there are still a few left. We got, we got a bunch extra for the holiday season. So still available on budovideos.com. And one of the cool things that they did this year is they made a donation. Shoei Roll donated over 100 toys to City of Hope. And, um, and they also made a $10,000 donation to Keep a Breast Foundation to fight uh, breast cancer. I thought that was really cool because neither of those amounts were... Um, <clears throat> were insignificant amounts, right? It's not this token effort. Like yeah. He actually put it out there to be, to as an actual charity. All right. Let's take a look at Gracie Baja's Orlando Sanchez and how this uh, toy donation went down. Hey guys, Orlando Sanchez here uh, with Show Your Roll. We just got finished uh, for the last like four hours. We went to Toys R Us. We spent a few thousand dollars on toys um, from the profits of uh, of the In Her Honor Gi from Show Your Roll. What an amazing feeling, man. We had like five, six carts. We packed them full of toys. I mean, it was it was an unreal feeling. You know, it was, it was very, very surreal. 
and uh, knowing that it's gonna help out a lot of kids, it was pretty awesome. So we packed up all the toys, came down here, now we're here at the City of Hope. We just got finished donating, you know, a few hundred, at least a few hundred toys. It was a few thousand dollars worth. I've never seen so many toys, but um, just speaking with the lady who organizes it, it's such an amazing feeling. I mean, I couldn't even imagine being a child here, you know, not even being able to get out of your bed or walk or strapped to IVs. And uh, knowing that us, Show Your Roll Jiu Jitsu in general, was able to put a smile on some of these kids' faces, man, it's like, gives me goosebumps, you know, thinking about it. It's uh, it's an unreal feeling. Unreal feeling that to know that uh, us as a Jiu Jitsu community, uh, you know, buying geese, really buying geese and having that help all these little kids in here in this hospital that aren't going to be walking. Some of them aren't even going to leave the hospital, you know. Um, just knowing that we can put some smiles on our faces. Unreal, man. Unreal. Great thing Joey Roll did with that release. Super Good job, cool. guys. It was cool seeing uh, the emotion show through in Orlando's voice as well. Yeah. So another big piece of news this week was Grappler's Quest. Oh, wow. We've all known Grappler's Quest from, geez, years. I don't know when they started, but at least you know throughout the 2000s, they've been having events all over the, the country. And uh, Brian Simmons has done a good job of catering to areas that maybe the IBJF didn't go right. to and um, you know, given people a lot of chances to compete. And unfortunately, um, according to our friend uh, at Edwin Najmi at bestofbjj.com. He has a quote from uh, Brian Simmons. It says, CEO Brian Simmons is taking a leave of absence from Grappler's Quest and has canceled all of the upcoming events in 2013. After 15 years of running the most prestigious grappling event for amateur grapplers, Simmons stated that he wants to focus on putting his family first. So 15 years he's been around. Looking at the competition scene, it seems like it's healthier than ever. IBJJF right. has spread all around the country. And for him to stop his organization is a little bit surprising. I and <clears throat> as I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the Grappler's Quest was is and was an institution. It's been around as, around as long as I've been around, and people have always talked about it. So it's this weird. I don't know. It's, it's almost as if I'm in disbelief because I can't. There's never been jujitsu without Grappler's Quest, or there's never been grappling without Grappler's Quest to me. So. I mean, I understand he wants to put his family first, and I can imagine the amount of time it takes to put on these events. He puts on big events as well, but I don't know. There's, there's this crazy... I, I, it's hard for me to wrap my head around. Yeah. I reached out to him, tried to get a quote for the show, but uh, I didn't get an answer from him today. But I wonder if there's more to the story, you know. Um, hopefully there's nothing bad happening to any right. of his family, family members that's taking up his uh, his time, but uh, that's unfortunate, and hopefully he'll be back in 2014. Yeah, we'll hope to see those. All right, uh, we'll be back with uh, Shanji Hibero in a bit, but first we got some new products to take a look at. The holiday season is upon us. There's not much time left before Christmas, but there's three products that came out that just this past week that I think you'd like to know about. The first one is the Ground Squad Gi from Control Industries. Control's been around for uh, not too long, but um, they have made some big strides in the gi game. This is a really interesting color combination of purple and turquoise. I think it came out really nice. It's called the Ground Squad Gi. I'm a big fan of the turquoise on black. It really pops when you see it in person. Yeah, it really does. Those are in stock at Budo Videos and $170 is the price. Next up is uh, a t-shirt from the Gracie Academy. This is the Helio Gracie versus Kimura commemorative a t-shirt. And uh, what a match this was. Cool old, scout, old school style, you know, promotional poster yeah. graphics. Really cool shirt. 35 bucks on that one. And the last one is from our buddy uh, Lucas Lepri. He came out with a guard passing DVD. Uh, he's one of the best guard passers right. in the business. And I haven't had a chance to look at it, but if, it, if Lucas is in it, you know it's going to be good. If Lucas is in it, you know you're going to need more than a glance at it, too. Yeah, for sure. All right, that's about it for this week. Um, we're going to be back in a moment with Shanji Hibero, so don't go anywhere. BudoVideos.com, home of the world's largest selection of quality jiu-jitsu kimonos. Show your roll, Storm, Tatami, Bull Terrier, Venom, and others. Styles from more than 30 top brands in stock and ready to ship. BudoVideos.com, you're only a click away from owning a new gi today.
Shanji Hibero, thanks for coming in today. Thank you guys for having me. Man, I feel so pumped up after watching that highlight of you. Uh, thanks. How thanks. do you feel when you see some of the highlights of your career? Uh, I kind of like, sometimes I feel like, did they really do that? <laughs> you know, like, uh, usually like when I get off my fights, I can barely remember what I did, like a second before. You know, and then sometimes you guys put all the stuff together, just just feels amazing, you know, like when you put like a sound on it, the, the action in it, you know, because I'm kind of like a slow pacer, like my, my pace of fight is a little slower, I get people into my pace. So when I got to see like the action really going, I said, well, that was pretty fast for, mm -hmm. for a big man. <laughs> you say you don't remember it. Do you, does your body just go on autopilot once you get stuck on the yeah, mat? Yeah, pretty much. You know, like I remember uh, 2008 when I fought uh, Val in the semifinal. You know, and then uh, I got off the mat, and then the first thing Fred, so my friend told me, like, hey, man, you hit your head so hard on the mat. Is you okay? And I'm like, what? I'm like, shit, yeah, I really hit my head. <laughs> so, yeah, usually I get people, like, asking me, oh, that position we did that day, you know, like, I just don't remember. You know, maybe, like, it just flows so much that I don't really have, like, a press set of, like, technique I'm going to do. Usually it's more instinct. So that's why I probably don't remember. Do you think that's like the high level of competition when you when you don't need to think about anything, you just go? Well, like it's not even just competition. I think it's the level of jujitsu. You know, uh, I'm a type of guy that I, I love training. I love doing like partial training. Uh, I'm not too much of a guy that I'll get like one position and try to just wrap that because a lot of times it's really hard to reproduce this in a competition. So I'd say that I'm more I'm more like a flowing guy, you know what I mean? I like when people exchange techniques with me and then I catch them the momentum, you know, because sometimes, you know, I heard one time someone saying that you're just like jazz, you never do the same accord same the exact same way. So, you know, I just keep it fun and and, and, and I like to experiment the the things that we don't understand and we don't see. So that's why I try to keep it that way. You've been training for 21 years now, is that right? Yeah, about 22 years, yeah. I started at 91, so my 22nd year. Is Jiu-Jitsu as much fun as it was 10, 20 years ago for you? Yeah, for sure. It's still fun, you know. Um, back in the day, it was a little, just a little different, you know, because we didn't have internet. We didn't have access to a lot of things. Um, Jiu-Jitsu rules were different. You know, we had, like, three referees. Uh, the mat or the old canvas mat with that particular smell, which mm -hmm. which I miss a lot, you know. Uh, knee in the stomach was two point, uh, was three points. Pass the guard was two. Um, you know, I think people fight a little more for the submission. You know, like wasn't too much like guard oriented, like competition. You know, you could slam, you could rip the knee. You know, there there really wasn't too many half guard. So that's the only thing. I think like the technical aspect has changed a lot, but I still think it's still fun, you know, to like going through all this phase of jujitsu and still be able to not just compete but train at the highest level. You mentioned the internet. Do you find that techniques are changing and improving more now because of the freer exchange of information? Yeah, you know, like uh, I think back in the day, what happened was we had the whole like, okay, my academy, my academy. So the information didn't really go around too much, you know, maybe like in the beginning of Jiu-Jitsu had like the Gracie family and then you have Carson Gracie and it was kind of like, okay, it's our technique, you know, and like people don't need to know, like we can't really teach the technique, it was kind of like a hidden secret, you know, and I think today uh, for the greater good of the sport and and for personal evolution of people, I think it's important, you know, to have access to, to just see and understand what happens because... For me, like, you know, how are we really going to know if you're really the best, if you everything is hidden, you know? And sometimes when a school or someone in the middle of nowhere has no access to anything, how that people going to evolve? And I think the, the evolution of the, the online systems and everything helps Jiu-Jitsu a lot in a sense to get information. But I believe that uh, you should not be too concerned about just watching it. You should go in the mat and do it. I think that's the main the main thing, you know. You have a doubt, you fix on the mat because I see a lot of people like, oh, I learned through, through online. Yeah, it's good, you know, but I still think that sweating and, and getting the, the, the action going is still the best way to learn. Do you learn from some of your competitors by watching their yeah, footage online? I learn from everybody. You know, I would, I would, I, it's, it's like all the time I fight someone, I steal something from them. Uh, I, I've learned so much, and throughout the years, 
Um, I have a big influence with like Hoja, of course, uh, Margarita, uh, Damian, Galvão, all those guys, you know. I try to fight like the little guys also, you know. Um, and I think it's just, uh, you know, it's just try to absorb the best of other people. And I think all the time I fight someone, I usually get out of it with someone from them, you know. I, I, I don't know, it's just, uh, it's just how I am, you know. I can fight you like today and the next day it just feels like our, our bias is just the same. You know, so it's just fun. You know, I think all the time I fight someone, I learn with them, with the energy, with the way they they, they they behave on the mat, how they try to achieve the technique, if they're nervous, if they're crazy, if they're not. So it's always a learning experience. And uh, and that's one of the reasons that I still fight, is just to get more of this. And then so I can walk out. Good thing the world at the end, so I have more opportunities yeah. to fight people. <laughs> Which is more important for you, the championship medal or maybe the cash that goes along with it, or is it the learning from the competition? Uh, I think it, it's a combination because you know, otherwise you're gonna go home and, and you're hungry, you know, and that, that I don't think that would be a good thing. But I think like a combination of everything is what's the three of it, you know. Uh, I think my quest today is try to bring a better word for the sport and and try to bring an image that you can bring more sponsors and people get can get more paid, uh, the tournaments can grow bigger, you know? And I think it just, just depends where you are in your life. You know, for a long time, I think it was just to go and win the championship, and then all of a sudden, I have won all the championships. I'm like, well, what's next for me, you know? And I think what's keeping me hungry is just, it's just, it's just that one thing is kind of like a, a personal evolution for me because I want to prove that my technique can endure years, you know? Doesn't matter 50 years from now, I still believe the technique that me, my brother, my family learned throughout, you know, the Gracie family and everything is still the best technique that there is, you know? And you can see Saulo fought through generations and I'm fighting guys and I'm watching my picture right there of Galvão and Galvão was a blue belt and I was a Pan American black belt champion in 2001, you know? And I'm fighting those guys for like six times already. You know, and it's just it's just to prove that sometimes it's not how much technique you know, but how good you know your own stuff. And that's what I try to do every day. And I think every day there is room to, to improvement. Mm, those are great points. Let's go back to the beginning. You were born in Manaus. Manaus, yes. Tell us a little bit about that area of Brazil. Uh, it's a great area. You know, uh, I was born in Manaus. Uh, my dad was a bank manager. We traveled a lot, so I moved to Fortaleza. Uh, for a period of time, and then moved back to Belém, which is another state, and then moved back to Manaus. Uh, I just pretty much, I did the judo back in the day, um, you know, until one day, this kid, you know, choked my neck, he was smaller than me, I got kind of got pissed at that. And then my brother, hey, man, I think you should get stronger. So that's when I started jiu-jitsu with the Monteiro brothers, you know, and there's a, a big school in Manaus, uh, the, the four brothers, they trained on the Hall of Gracie. At the time, I think they were like, purple belts at the time, you know, and we, we were a huge team, we still were a huge team over there. And that's where I started, you know, and uh, Manaus is great, man, it's just big, it's it's hot, a lot, very hot. The only pretty much thing you have to do is to train jiu-jitsu and uh, eat good fish and uh, go, go like a uh, wakeboard or go to the, the waterfalls, it's just, I think it's just great to be in that environment in the middle of the Amazon. Um, I was a kid that I was I was I grew up like running errands in the jungles and stuff with the kids and getting late. One time, uh, it was a funny story. Uh, I was so young I didn't have those teeth in front of me, right? And uh, we just like used to gather together. Say, oh, let's do an adventure in the jungle. I'm like, all right, cool, let's go. So we're going. Like all of a sudden, we went like from eight in the morning until sunset. So we're coming back and we're all laughing and stuff. And there's these three guys coming in and say, hey. Guys, there's this crazy parents. Like they call the police, the firefighters, they look for this kid, they're like they 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 sons disappeared and and, and they were like, Oh, really I'm looking at the guy, listen to that. And he's like, Yeah, she said like it's a little kid, he has no teeth on his on his mouth and I'm like, Really? <laughs> and I had him know my teeth on my mouth and then and, and then they say, Well, is your mother's this name? I'm like, Yes, yeah, oh she's crazy behind you, so I run home crying. <laughs> so that, that that was a good thing, you know, like we just stay on the streets all the time with the friends. Of course, after we do our homework, which is very important, you know. And then uh, after a while, I went to a military college, like school. There's a, it's not like a military, but it's, it's run by the military association in, in Brazil. And I went there where I graduated and went to college in Rio for three years to, to law school. 
and then I quit law school to 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 unravel the laws of jiu-jitsu. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just ask you about law school. It's, I know a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of Brazilians that I know, and it's limited to mostly jiu-jitsu guys that I know, but. Horian Gracie was a, a law, went to law school. Uh, Dracolino went to law school. Is that a really common thing in Brazil to go to law school? Uh, not really common, but uh, I think it's it's because in Brazil it's really hard. Like even though the economy is really big, uh, I think when you're a good lawyer, and uh, I think a lot of people do law school to do like public uh, like courses. Like uh, for example, you want to be a prosecutor mm. or be a judge. I think that's where people gear more to. You mm. know. Um, the reason that, well, of course, the reason that I quit uh, law school was because, of course, I moved to to Ohio to go teach jiu-jitsu. But I just thought that the whole the whole system just didn't work work well. You know, I started to see all my friends. They they just like they still learning how to do the work. And they are already stressed. They are getting fat. I'm like, I don't want that to me. You know, and then the only re- the only way I would do something is if I would actually put people in jail. I couldn't see myself. You know, defending a criminal, or, or you know what I mean. So I say, you know, and I had the opportunity to move to Ohio through one of our first black belts, Chris Blanky, and I moved to Toledo. And I'm like, man, as in six months I was in Toledo. I said, man, that's what I want. You know, I wanna, I wanna live my life honestly. I wanna teach things that I love and what I think I can make people grow with. And I think that that was Jiu-Jitsu, and that's when I chose my path. Did you have any culture shock when you moved to Ohio? Um, a little bit, you know. Uh, I moved, I just turned 21, and Ohio is a very American place, uh, so I had no Brazilian, you know, influence at all, different than California, coming here, you speak Portuguese every day. Um, I have a great, you know, like my friends there, Chris, and other guys that received me there, They, I just love them right at the bat, you know. Uh, it's a couple of things, you know, not to have like as much freedom you have in Brazil, Ohio is very cold. Um, but, uh, you know, like I said, my love for jiu-jitsu and, and to develop the, the Ribeiro jiu-jitsu uh, within the United States, I think that, that drove me a lot, you know. And uh, and that's where I did my whole training. Uh, pretty much I, I got my black belt and I moved to America, so i never really been a black belt in Brazil. So my whole black belt life, career is being, is being developed in the United States with my white belt and blue belt students, you know. And, my, and the first tournament that I competed, uh, as a black belt, it was the 2001 Pan American Championships, and, and I got to win the first place in the absolute. My training camp, they're all my students. They're all like white belts and blue belts, and uh, and I'm really I'm really happy for that. And the cultural shock was more like you know in Brazil, there's a lot of freedom. You know, like you don't have to be 21 to go to a bar and have a beer. Uh, you know, kind of figure out how to go around the girls. This was different too, you know, the whole dancing thing, you know, because in Brazil it's more like you go and you kiss and, you know, it's just a little different, those, those little things. But I think uh, have the ability to, to make a living, uh, drive with a decent car, and I used to say people just open the left side and has hot water, that makes a whole difference, you know. And uh, since then, when I moved back to Brazil, six months after that, I was like, and then Brazil was actually a cultural shock for me, you know, because I'm used to like turn the signal to turn right. All of a sudden, people are honking the horn, and I stop in the pedestrian thing, and people are like, "Why are you stopping the pedestrian thing?" You know, it's just it's just those little things, you know. But uh, but I'm a little chameleon, you know. I can adapt pretty well, just like in jiu-jitsu, you know. I can adapt to any rule, and I think uh, you know once I I had that phase you know, higher and learn about the culture and about the language and everything. And I think I knew that that here where I wanted to stay. Who would you say you learned most of your jiu-jitsu from? Definitely my brother, yeah. he uh, He's a genius, you know, and uh, so simple, you know. That's the thing about him. It uh, took me a while to understand a lot of his concepts, you know. I think the jiu-jitsu my brother taught me was more conceptual and mindset than the actual put your hand here and do this. You know, I think that was the greater thing, you know, because to teach a technique, anyone can teach a technique. But to teach the real way to see something, and I think that's that's the key of it. And, and Saul is a genius. And, of course, until today when I think, like, oh, I know the, the answer for this, I go to him, like, hey, man, just move here, put your weight here, and do this. I'm like, shit, you know, it was so simple, you know. And that's what I think about him, you know. He's not a guy that's going to go around this to go to a point. He's just a straight to the point. And uh, I think that's one of the characteristics of our jiu-jitsu. You know, we keep it simple. We cut the bullshit. We go straight to the point. We get a dominant spot. And, and once you get a dominant spot, and then, my friend, 
you better push hard because we're going to stay. Do you think your jiu-jitsu is the same as your brother's? Uh, I think the fundamental, everybody's asking me that, you know. Uh, I think uh, the, the thought process and the fundamentalism of our game uh, is pretty much the same. Uh, I like to say uh, we're two sides of a coin with the same value. That's how I usually describe this for, for everybody. But of course, because my body type is different than his body type, I'm a little more flexible than him. Uh, my personality is a little, little different than his, you know, so that, that plays a big game. Uh, what you play, you know, he's a type of guy that he has, he, he does not, if you if you read his book, he say, I don't give no, no margin for mistakes, I don't care, I'm going to fight, I'm going to be precise, I don't care, I cut you, and that's it. I'm more the type of guy, well, whatever, I know if you, if that doesn't happen, I find another way to do it, you know, so it's just, I think, that because of the personality and the body type that we, we have different, and I think that that's the difference in our game, you know, but I think the jiu-jitsu, the, the root, is the same, the strength of the roots are the same, but maybe the flowers and the fruit that comes out of it might be a little different. So when you compete competitively in the academy with you and your brother, who wins? <laughs> <laughs> we both win. <laughs> you know, uh, it's just fun, you know, like I said, he he's so strong and he's so precise and he's short. And the thing is, his body type is the worst for me. And that's why I think, um, it's funny, one time I made a comment uh, like but my brother was my worst training partner and when I mentioned that it's because I have not seen I think Hodge was the one that kind of made me feel about the same nobody makes me feel as uncomfortable as my brother does you know what I mean um, as far as like man I'm so uncomfortable get away from me you know I felt that to my brother I can actually still feel with that it's like man I can't move this guy like <clears throat> why am I going to move this guy you know uh, and, and, and no one. I cannot name one guy in jiu-jitsu that I ever fought that felt the same. I can mention Roger, but Roger's a little different again because he's a bigger guy. It's like you're pushing, you push off nothing. And all of a sudden there's another this amount of sand on the top of you. You know, Sal is more like a brick wall that you can't push. Roger is more like maybe a, a sandbox. If you push, all of a sudden there's sand all over you. And that's how I see both. But they're both very uncomfortable. And that's why I say that Sal is, my, is the worst. You know, it's because there's nothing that Anyone can reproduce that what he does, and that's why when I go to competition for me is uh, not just competition, just jiu-jitsu in general. You know, it's so comfortable. Like I'm never really uncomfortable. Do you think you would be as successful as you are without your brother? Uh, maybe because I do believe that I had talent mm. to 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 do it. Mm. You know, um, I think in one way or another I would accomplish some of my goals and I think I would and not have accomplished a lot of goals you know same way as him you know right. and I think like I said we, we complement each other in a very beautiful way you know and for the fact that we're so different that's what makes it even better mm. you know you see like couple like even like I think maybe Leo Vieira and Ricardo they were like so different too you know and that was beautiful and then you see uh, like the Mendes brothers they're like very similar body type you know but you can see that Guilherme has a little different game than they have a, but if you look at me and my brother, it's like two different people, right? You know, but of course, but if you see like in certain situations of dominance position on the passing, in the way we do things, is very similar. But but yeah, you know, I think you know, I, I own him a lot on my on my success because, like I said, maybe I wouldn't be as comfortable as I would be competing if I didn't have Sal as a training partner, and it would suck to fight him in a competition for sure. <laughs> One of the exciting things about watching you and your brother compete is that your stand-up is always great. You know, you or your brother, if you have the opportunity, you always go for a throw or a flying attack. What's your philosophy on stand-up? Are you opposed to pulling guard? I'm not opposed to pulling guard, but I'm. I'm, I'm the thing is, uh, I like challenges no matter what, you know. The reason you pull guard, you pull guard to do a submission, to do a reversal, or to finish the fight there. And that's how I see it, you know. Um... And the thing about competition is people are pulling guard to wait and to play with the rule. That's the only problem that I see, you know? I don't really... And the way I see the competition is like jiu-jitsu become more a sweeping art than anything else. You know, it's the art of sweep people. If you see, there's like probably like 300 million thousand different sweeps. Probably like an average person can do 2% of this, you know? Um, I think I think uh, the thing that I, that I see is like is about the challenge. You know, if I have a chance to throw you in your head, I'm gonna throw you in your head. You know, uh, if I see it's getting hard, I'll pull guard. You know, 
Uh, but like I said, I like to be complete, you know, and uh, I, st I, I think that there's still a couple of things in my game that, that can be, you know, evolved in a sense. You know, but but yeah, if I can, if I have a chance to grab your gear really strong and toss you on your head, I will. If if that doesn't happen, if I don't feel that I can do it, I'll pull guard. You know, and that's how it is. You know, because I feel really good when I put my hand in someone's neck and I'm choking them, and 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 that's what I do, and that's what I try to do 100% of the time. I have a little OCD. I'm a little compulsive. You know, I can't hold sleeves and legs and just stay there. I have to go and attack you. Uh, in my conception, is a real attack. Because sweeping is not really a real attack, in my opinion. You know, you see a lot of fights. If you put a lot of fights here, you could see probably 95% of the fights. You don't see really people, okay, if I would spend as much effort to hold your sleeves, it would be the same effort to pull your arm and try to arm lock you, and that would be one thing. And that's how I see it. But, uh, you know, like I said, I like the challenge because I know one day I'll face someone that has a badass guard. One day I'll face someone that has a badass guard pass. What are you gonna do? Call mommy? No. You know, you gotta go and fight. And then, and Jiu Jitsu is start standing. And uh, we need to, to remember that. You know, we need to evolve our takedowns. And that's how it is. So, what's gonna go when you're on the street? You wanna pull guard? It's not gonna happen. You need to have. And, 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 and the best thing about it, Judo is the best conditioning for Jiu Jitsu. It's not lifting a bunch of weight. Just go to judo and, and break and grip and try to beat the crap out of each other. It's the best conditioning for jiu-jitsu. And that's why me and Saul, we're always in good condition because when the fight stands up, we're ready to stand up. Some people are not, you know, and that's usually when you see when someone's broken or not. The fight scrambles, go off the bounce, and they take three minutes to stand up. You're like, man, for me, this is easy. I train judo every day, you know, but of course. Training is training, you know, you pull guard, you do whatever, you know, but competition is like this, you know, if you, you can pay the strategy also, you know, for example, you get a guy like, you know, Brawley, whatever, has a good guard, so you have to, you just have to catch him in between, maybe pull earlier, and then, and then that's a strategy, it's not anymore really like jujitsu.